much for having me here. It's a uh, real pleasure and honor. I'll be talking about creativity today, what it is, how we can get more of it. But I'd like to begin with a story. It's a story that takes place on August 5th, 1949, in the Man Gulch wilderness. The Man Gulch is a place of geological contradiction. It's where the Rocky Mountains meet the Great Plains, where these steep slopes all of, all of a sudden descend into grassy prairies. And on August 5th, the hottest day ever recorded in the area, 107 degrees, there was a dry thunderstorm. It lit some tinder brush, and so a small wilderness fire erupted. It was spotted by a plane flying overhead, and it was called in, and so a small crew of 13 smoke jumpers, these are wilderness firefighters who jump out of planes, was dispatched. A guy named Wag Dodge was in charge of the smoke jumper crew. When they took off from Missoula, Montana to go fight this fire, they were told that the Man Gulch fire was less than 10 acres, just a small blaze that they should be able to contain in a few hours. By the time they actually leapt out of this old World War II cargo bomber, the fire had grown to 500 acres. So as Wag Dodge and his men are parachuting, descending down onto the ground, they all of a sudden see this fire, which is crowned, which is just going out of control. So as soon as Wag Dodge lands, his men gather together their stuff, Wag Dodge realizes that this fire is way too big, that there is no way they can fight it, let alone contain it. So he tells his men that they're gonna head down to the Missouri River. They're gonna seek the safety of water. So they start marching down this very steep slope, this very steep hill towards the river. They're about three quarters of the way down when all of a sudden the wind shifts. It's the twilight hour and that tends to happen. And so Wag Dodge watches as these embers and sparks as they hover in the air. And then he watches as these sparks leap across the river, across the water, and then light the grass, this dry, dry grass right between him and the river, right between his men and the safe, the safe spot they were walking towards. So now all of a sudden there's a wall of flame between Wag Dodge and his men and the Missouri River. These men do what we all would do. They start running away, you know? There's a, there's a wall of flame between them and the water. So they start running back uphill, back to the place where they came from. So they start doing that. Wag Dodge yells at his men to run as fast as they can. Two minutes go by and Wag Dodge looks over his shoulder and he sees that the fire is gaining on them. Because here's the problem with running away uphill from a fire, from a wall of flame, that because heat rises, fire actually accelerates on the uphill. So when Wag Dodge turned over his shoulder after a couple minutes, later estimates by the Forest Service were that this wall of flame was already 100 feet tall, it was moving 30 miles per hour, and it was so hot that it was melting the rock. It was 2,000 degrees, so that's exactly what these men were running from. So at this point, Wag Dodge yells at his men to drop all their gear, to run even faster, that's exactly what they do. They run even faster. Two more minutes go by, Wag Dodge looks over his shoulder again and he suddenly realizes that there is no way these men are gonna outrun the fire. That it's just moving too fast, it's way too hot, that none of these men are gonna make it to the top of the ridge. They're all gonna die. They're all gonna die while running. So he yells at his men to stop running. They look at him, of course, like he's lost his mind. They assume He's committing suicide, but Wag Dodge isn't. In that moment, he experiences a blinding flash of insight. He suddenly realizes how he can escape from this wall of flame. He gets out his book of matches, lights a match, lights the ground right in front of him. He watches as his little fire spreads down and around. Then he gets out his handkerchief, gets the last water from his canteen, puts it on his handkerchief, ties the handkerchief around his mouth, and then he lies down in this burnt plot of earth. And because fire can burn what's already been burned, he waits for the fire, for this wall of flame to pass right over him. 30 seconds later, that's exactly what happens. It sounds like a freight train, Dodge would later say, but he emerges unscathed. All of his men, they all die. Nobody makes it to the ridge. The reason I'm telling you this story is because I want to focus in on that moment of insight, on that flash of insight, that epiphany that happened to Wag Dodge as he was running from a wall of flame. Psychologists in recent years have spent a lot of time trying to understand where these moments of insight come from, how we solve our hardest problems in a second. 
And it turns out there are actually two defining features of these moments of insight. The first defining feature is that they come out of the blue. You know, Wag Dodd just thought he was running away from fire. He wasn't thinking about how to invent an escape fire. Escape fires, of course, are now a standard firefighting technique. They're one of the first things every wilderness firefighter learns in basic training. Wag Dodge wasn't thinking about that. He was just trying to stay alive. And yet, boom, the answer just popped into his head, came out of the blue. So that's the first defining feature. The answer just surprises us. It's as if the brain is just sharing one of its secrets. The second defining feature is that as soon as the answer arrives, we know it's the right answer. We don't have to double check the math. We don't have to think about the physics of fires or oxygen. We know this is how we're going to save our life. So the answer comes attached with this feeling of certainty. So those are the two defining features of moments of insight. And I think some of the most interesting research in moments of insight has been done by two scientists, Mark Beeman at Northwestern and John Cuneos at Drexel. And when, when they began studying moments of insight, trying to figure out how the brain produces these epiphanies, they, of course, ran into the obvious experimental problem, which is that you can't just put people in a brain scanner and say, OK, we're ready. Have an epiphany now. Any moment, have a breakthrough. That'd be a really inefficient way to collect lots of data. So instead, what Beeman and Cuneos had to do was to invent word problems that require moments of insight, but that you can generate lots of while you're conducting an actual experiment. So after a couple years of struggle and experimentation, they ended up coming up with a set of word puzzles that can reliably generate lots of moments of insight. They're called compound remote associate problems. The acronym's a bit unfortunate, C-R-A-P. Uh, but, but the problems go like this. So we'll do the first one together. I'm going to give you three words, and you're going to have to find the fourth word that can form a compound word with those three. So the first three words are pine, crab, and sauce. The answer here is apple, pineapple, crab apple, applesauce. So apple is the insight. So now it's your turn. So I'm going to give you three words. Find the fourth word that can form a compound word with these three. Age, mile, and sand. And if you have that aha moment, just shout it out. Stone, so someone right in front just had a moment of insight. The answer, if you did it pretty quick, so the answer probably just popped into your head. And as soon as it popped into your head, you, you probably didn't have time to double check it. You just shouted it out because you knew it was right. So it's a classic moment of insight. So Beeman and Cuneos could give people these problems in brain scanners. And the first thing they discovered is that when you give people these word problems, that 30 milliseconds before they have the moment of insight, before stone pops into your head or apple leaps into consciousness, you see a surge of activity in a brain area called the superior anterior temporal gyrus. It's right about there, right behind your ear in the right hemisphere. To be honest, it's an obscure part of the brain that nobody knows too much about. The only other thing it's previously been associated with is the processing and invention of metaphors. And that makes a little bit of sense. You know, when Romeo says that Juliet is like the sun, we know that he's not saying that Juliet is a big flaming ball of hydrogen gas. Instead, we know that he's actually saying that his world revolves around Juliet, like, like our world revolves around the sun. We're able to look past the surface dissimilarities and see the overlapping associations, the underlying associations that Juliet and Sons actually have in common. That's how we make sense of every metaphor. That's how we invent metaphors. And the same mental talent is required when we find the one word that pine, crab, and sauce can combine with. We've probably never used pine, crab, and sauce in a sentence together before. These aren't three words that go together a lot. Yet what this little brain area in the back of your right hemisphere is so good at is seeing the one other word, apple, that they all share, that they can all be combined with. So this one brain area seems to be very, very good at finding those remote associations, finding those underlying and very subtle connections that are often so essential when we solve our hardest problems. So that's the first thing Beeman and Cuneos discovered, which is the importance of this obscure brain area in the right hemisphere for solving moments of insight. The second thing they discovered was with EEG. It's when you where it looks like a bulky shower cap, and it's a device that allows scientists to record and measure the waves of electricity produced by your brain. And here's where Beeman and Kunis discovered something very, very peculiar. So that they could predict up to eight seconds in advance whether or not you were going to have a moment of insight. Now, think for a moment how weird this is. They could look at your EEG. 
look at your waves produced by your brain and say, you know what, you are wasting your time. You could sit here all day with these compound remote associate problems and you wouldn't solve a single one. You're just not in the right state of mind. You should just go home. Or they could say, you know what, in about seven and a half seconds, you're about to have an epiphany. Brace yourself. It's a very, very predictive signal. It turns out the signal is something called alpha waves. Like most things in the mind, alpha waves remain pretty mysterious. But they're very closely associated with states of relaxation. So your brain is full of alpha waves, producing lots of alpha waves when you're taking a warm shower, when you're playing ping pong, when you're going for a long walk in a pastoral place, when you're lying on your bed listening to your favorite music. These are all activities in which we're relaxed and we have lots of alpha waves. Why do alpha waves lead to moments of insight? Well, what the scientists argue is that when we're not relaxed, when there aren't lots of alpha waves in our brain, we're really focused on the world outside. We're obsessed, we're fixated on pine crab and sauce, pine crab and sauce, on the terms of the problem. And, and sometimes that's good, but when we need an insight, all the noise of the world directing the spotlight of attention outwards means that we can't hear that quiet voice in the back of our head saying the answer is actually Apple. The answer is Apple. That voice is drowned out by the noise of reality. It's not until we're relaxed, until we're in the warm shower shampooing our hair, and we can actually turn the spotlight of attention inwards. That's when we finally hear that quiet voice telling us what the answer is. It's been telling us the answer all along. It wasn't until we actually took a moment to listen that we could actually hear that voice. Now, there is, of course, something a little counterintuitive about this. I think most people assume that when you give them a really hard problem, a problem that requires a moment of insight, that their inclination is to, you know, drink a triple espresso, to chug Red Bull, to snort some Ritalin, to do whatever they need to do to stay focused, you know, to fixate on the task, to chain themselves to their desk. But what the science suggests is that's the exact wrong thing to do. We'll be so focused, but the wrong answer will just loop in our head. So what this research suggests is that when we're stumped on a problem, when we don't know what to do, we can't even conceive of a solution, we've hit the wall, that's when we need to step away and take a really long, warm shower. Because it's when we stop looking for the answer that the answer will actually arrive. Kunios tells a great story about one of the times they brought a uh, trained Tibetan Buddhist monk into their lab. It's one of these guys who, you know, he spends 10 hours a day meditating. So he's got exquisite control over the spotlight of attention. Tremendous cognitive control mechanisms. And at first they give this guy these compound remote associate problems. And he's going like 0 for 40. He can't solve a single one. And the scientists are starting to get a little worried. You know, maybe this guy isn't that bright. Maybe he's got an aphasia, some language problems. Who knows? Because normally people can solve at least a few to go 0 for 40. Then all of a sudden, after going 0 for 40, they watch as his EEG abruptly shifts. And all of a sudden, they see this dramatic spike in alpha waves. And that's when this monk becomes, as Cuneus describes it, an insight machine. He solves 27 compound remote associate problems in a row, just one after another, a streak they've never seen before or since. And what the scientists, how the scientists explain this uncanny streak, that at first the monk assumed the way to solve these problems was to focus on them, to fixate on pine, crab, and sauce. But then after going over 40, he realized that that strategy wasn't working. So that's when he was able to focus on not being focused. He was able to let himself go a little bit, to finally listen to that quiet voice in the back of his head. And that's when he became an insight machine. Now, I would love to stand up here and tell you that the way to solve every creative problem is to take really long, warm showers. That, that we always think best when we're relaxed. But unfortunately, that would be a lie. It turns out that a lot of our creative problems don't require moments of insight, that we shouldn't always be relaxed. That's not always the best way to come up with a new answer. That sometimes we need to work really hard. Sometimes we do need to drink those triple espressos, do whatever it takes to keep our attention focused on the problem at hand. And to illustrate the power of this kind of attention, I can tell you another story. It's the story of Mohan Srivastava. He's a geological statistician who lives in Toronto. And in 2003, for his 40th birthday, 
he was given a joked birthday gift by his squash partner of lottery tickets. Mo is a very bright guy, graduate degrees in statistics from MIT and Stanford. So he's always making fun of people who buy lottery tickets, you know, it's a tax on idiots, that's what he used to call it. So his squash partner said, you know, it's a joke gift. Here are a few scratch tic-tac-toe lottery tickets. Have fun with them. Mo has a very, very messy office. He proceeded to lose these tic-tac-toe scratchers and the piles of paper on his desk for the next few weeks. But then a couple weeks later, he's waiting for a large file of geological data to download. And he decides to clean his office, to move some papers around. That's when he rediscovers these tic-tac-toe tickets. And he's so bored that he decides to scratch them. He decides to play them. The first five tickets are all losers, and this only confirms Moe's bias against the lottery. See, it's just a tax on idiots. You never win. But then ticket number six was a winner, just a small winner, a $5 winner. But as Moe describes it, he became irrationally excited. This was so thrilling to him, the possibility of winning $5 for nothing, that he just couldn't wait to redeem his ticket. So as soon as he scratches it off and sees that it's a winner, he decides to march right down to the corner store and get a free chips and coffee with his big winnings. And that's exactly what he does. It's about a five-minute walk to the Petro-Canada station, to the corner store where he can cash in his ticket. And on his walk, Mo, this expert in statistics, this guy who spends all his, who spends his entire days working with all sorts of statistical algorithm, starts to wonder how you might engineer these tickets. Because these are something called baited hook tickets. So if I could just describe them briefly, there's a row of numbers on the left. And those are the, that's, that's where you actually scratch off the latex. So those are the concealed numbers. And then most of the ticket, about 90% of the ticket, is filled with these tic-tac-toe boxes. And these tic-tac-toe boxes, what lottery designers call the baited hook, are filled with visible numbers. You know, so there are various tic-tac-toe squares, and there are 72 visible numbers on the ticket. And the purpose of these visible numbers is twofold. One, it gives people the illusion of control. So if you're in a 7-Eleven and you see a tic-tac-toe ticket with your birthday on it and those visible numbers, you're more likely to buy that ticket. But the real benefit of these kinds of baited hooks is to make the game take longer. And instead of just scratching it off and seeing if you've got a winner or a loser, you're able to you know, spend a minute searching for numbers that can build in lots of near misses. So it's a really important gaming device that allows lottery tickets to compete with, say, slot machines and other games of chance. So baited hook games have become really popular in the last 10 to 15 years in the lottery industry. So Moe's walking to the corner store and he starts to think about how you might design a ticket with one of these elaborate baited hooks. Because on the one hand, these numbers appear random, right? They appear that the lottery company just threw some numbers randomly on a ticket and that's it. And you either get a winner or a loser, but it's all random. That's the illusion. Mo, of course, knows that the lottery company is actually working under some very, very strict constraints. So they have to know exactly how many winners they're going to pay out. They have to know how many winners there are in each category. They have to evenly distribute winners to the various areas of the province. So there's actually nothing random about this ticket at all. So Mo starts to think about which algorithms he would use if he were designing this lottery ticket. It's a five-minute walk, and he comes up with some pretty good answers on this five-minute walk gets to the corner store, gets his free chips and coffee, he's happy as a clam, walks back to his office, doesn't think about lotteries for the rest of the afternoon, gets to work on this geological data. A few hours later, early evening, he's walking home, and he walks by this corner store. And as he walks by this corner store, he hears this voice in the back of his head. And Mo insists when I tell a story that I point out, that, and I make it very clear, that he is not the kind of guy who normally hears voices. He is, a, he is a, not a crazy person. He is a very sober-minded statistician. But as he's walking by this gas station with the 7-Eleven, he hears this voice in the back of his head. And this is what the voice tells him. The voice says, but if you do it that way, if you use those algorithms, the game will be fatally flawed. You will be able to plunder the lottery. Mo, of course, does what we'd all do. He says, oh, that's crazy talk. This stupid voice in the back of my head has no idea what it's talking about. The Ontario Lottery Gaming Corporation is a $4 billion a year business. There is no way they would produce a game that could be plundered, a game that I, some you know, geological statistician, could crack. So Mo tries to ignore the voice. That's what he does for the next two hours. He tries to watch the ball game 
the voice just won't go away, won't leave him alone. So finally, he's so annoyed by this voice, that he decides to spend what he assumes will be a few minutes proving this voice wrong. Needless to say, that's not what happens. 18 hours later, after a six pack of Cokes and innumerable coffees, Mo has found, Mo has discovered that the voice was actually right that he can break the game, that simply by looking at the visible numbers on the baited hook, the numbers that are visible before you scratch anything off, that you can just sit there at the counter and just pick out the winning tickets, that he can do that with 95% accuracy. So before he scratches off the latex, he can predict with 95% accuracy which tickets are winners, which ones are gonna pay out more than they cost, and which ones are losers. And this isn't just some obscure tic-tac-toe game, the Ontario Lottery. He's since shown that this can be done with at least 12 other games all across North America, games in eight different states. So this has become a serious problem for the lottery industry and led to some very, very important reforms as they've really tried to make their baited hooks less vulnerable to this kind of cracking. But what I'd like to focus on for the next few minutes is that voice in the back of Moe's head, that feeling of knowing. That's the eloquent name, that's the eloquent psychological term for what that voice is. It's called a feeling of knowing. It's something that we all deal with every day. One of my favorite examples of a feeling of knowing, one of these intuitions that we can do something, that we can solve something, that we have some knowledge inside our head. So in a words in the tip of your tongue, you know, you're walking down the street and you see someone, you know you know their name, Maybe they're an old friend from high school, a distance acquaintance on Facebook. You know you know their name, but you just can't quite place it. On the one hand, this is an annoying mental hiccup. You know, it's frustrating. You know, we'd love to know this guy's name, but we just can't quite remember it. Yet at the same time, it's also a little profound, because how do we know we know his name if we don't actually know it? You know, how are we so convinced that we can remember this person's name if we don't actually have the memory? Well, that's where feelings of knowing become so essential. What the feeling of knowing is telling you is that if you just spend the next 20 minutes, the next half an hour, the next few minutes sometimes, searching for this person's name, eventually you will find it. Eventually that name will pop into your consciousness and your eyes will go all wide and say, aha, that's it, I can remember this guy's name. Turns out, and this is the remarkable thing about feelings of knowing, that they're often remarkably accurate that when you give people all sorts of creative problems, math problems, word problems, problems that don't require moments of insight, so they're solved in analytical fashion, when you give people this vast range of creative problems, that their feelings of knowing can accurately diagnose which problems they can solve between 80 and 90% of the time. So even though we don't know what the answer is, even though we don't have an inkling of what the answer is, of where we'll end up, our brain can tell us, you know what, we can get there. If you give us an hour, if you give us a day, if you give us a week, if you give us a month, we often have a pretty good sense of the time horizons. We can tell ourselves, eventually this feeling of knowing will become actual knowledge. Eventually I will crack this creative problem. So 80 to 9% of the time, our feelings of knowing are accurate. They can accurately diagnose which problems we can solve. What makes these feelings of knowing even more useful is that they come attached with a sense of progress. So you give people this vast range of creative problems. They not only can say which problems they can solve, but as they're working on the creative problems, they can say, I'm getting closer. I'm getting warmer to the solution. Now, just think for a moment how, how kind of weird this is. It's like dropping someone in a strange city, a city they've never been to before, telling them they got to get to some place, they have no idea where this place is, and yet they're still able to accurately say whether or not they're getting closer to the destination. It's, it's a very bizarre talent, yet it's also a great creative talent. And I think, as Mo demonstrates, when you've got these feelings of knowing, when you've got this voice telling you, you know what, you can solve this problem, there is a flaw in this lottery game that you can find if only you spend the next 18 hours juiced on caffeine, you can find it. You will eventually uncover it, unconceal the lottery ticket. When you've got those feelings of knowing, what the research suggests is that you need to invest in attention. You need to stay focused. You need to chain yourself to your desk. The answer doesn't require a moment of insight. If you've got a feeling of knowing, if you've got a hunch that you can solve it, then you need to keep on working. You just need to keep on working and working and working. You need to stay focused on the task at hand. It won't be fun. 
It won't be pleasant, you'll be grumpy, you'll be tired, but that is how you'll solve the problem. Now, what I think this suggests is a two-pronged framework for solving creative problems. So sometimes we need moments of insight, you know, when you're completely stumped, when you've hit the wall, when there is no feeling of knowing, that's when you need to take a warm shower. That's when you need to take a break. That's when you need to find some way to increase your alpha waves. However, if you feel that feeling of knowing, if you've got one of these intuitions telling you you can solve the problem, if you feel like you're making progress, then don't take a shower. Just keep on working. Chain yourself to your desk. Do whatever you need to do to stay focused, to stay fixated on the problem, because eventually it will arrive. So far, I've been talking about creativity in the individual mind, right? From the perspective of a single brain, about moments of insight in a single right hemisphere, and about how sometimes we need to increase our attention when we've got these feelings of knowing. But of course, in the real world, creativity really isn't just about individuals, that we're often put in teams. We often require teams to solve our hardest problems, that our breakthroughs often depend on some chance interaction, some errant comment, some kind of group dynamic, that sometimes our problems require us to be in these teams because that's when we become more than the sum of our parts. I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking about what I think is a very important lesson for group creativity, how we can actually become one of those groups that is more than the sum of its parts. Now, when you first start talking to people about group creativity, it seems like a problem we've already solved, right? When you put people in a group and you give them a creative problem, what they should do is brainstorm. Brainstorming is probably the most widely implemented creativity technique of all time. It was first invented in the 1950s by Alex Osborne, an advertising executive. And according to Osborne's rules, which he laid out in a series of best-selling books, there are two rules to a productive brainstorming session. Just two rules. The first, rules, the first rule is that you can't criticize. No criticism allowed anywhere near the brainstorming session. That's for a very simple reason, according to Osborne. The imagination is very meek, it's very shy, it's very timid. And if it's worried about getting criticized, about having its ideas shouted down, it'll just clamp up. It'll just, you know, shut itself down and the brainstorming session will fail. There will be no free associations, there will be no good ideas shared. So that's why it's very, very important in the brainstorming session to not criticize. The second crucial rule of brainstorming, according to, according to Osborne, is it's all about quantity, not quality. That you shouldn't worry about the quality of ideas, just worry about getting all the ideas you can up on the board. Now, it's worth pointing out that there's a very good reason that brainstorming has been so successful and so widely implemented, because it makes us feel really good. You know, after a brainstorming session, we all feel good about ourselves. We all feel really productive. No one's been criticized. We're proud of our free associations. The blackboard, the whiteboard is filled with all these ideas. It seems like it was a very good use of our hour. There's only one small problem with brainstorming, which is that it just doesn't work. Study after study after study has shown that people in brainstorming groups actually become less creative than if you gave them the exact same problem but told them to work by themselves. So in other words, when we brainstorm, we don't become more than the sum of our parts, we become less than the sum of our parts. It actually diminishes individual creativity. Now, the reason brainstorming doesn't work gets back to the first rule of Osborne's, which is don't criticize. That might seem like a common sense rule, but it actually really diminishes the imagination in groups. And I think it's probably best demonstrated by Charlene Nemeth, she's a psychologist at UC Berkeley, and she's shown this in a number of ways, but my favorite is when she asks people, and she's done this in numerous cities all across the world, she asks them to brainstorm on ways to decrease traffic in their city, so in their hometown, find ways to reduce gridlock. She divides people into three different kinds of groups. The first group is classic brainstorming, they're given these two golden rules, don't criticize, quantity, not quality. The second condition, they're allowed to come up with whatever rules they want. They can, bra they can brainstorm, they can criticize each other, they can do whatever they want. The third condition, it's called the dissent condition. These are people who are actively encouraged to engage in criticism, to engage in these acts of dissent. And what Namath finds, to make a long story short, 
And she's done this, this basic experiment dozens of times all across the world, is that groups in the same condition consistently come up with about twice as many ways to reduce traffic, which not only do they have more ideas, but their ideas are rated as better by an independent panel of experts. Actual traffic experts say these ideas are better. So when we criticize each other, we come up with more ideas, and those ideas are better. But the part of her experiments I'm most intrigued by is what happens next. So the next day, the following day, she brings everyone back into her lab, and she says, OK, so yesterday you had to do this group exercise, find ways to reduce traffic. Since that experiment, since this group exercise, have you had any more new ideas on your own? Just have you continued thinking about it? And what she finds is that people in the descent condition now come up with seven times more new ideas in the 24 hours after the experiment than people in the other two conditions, especially in the brainstorming condition. And so what this suggests is that dissent and criticism, they don't clamp down the imagination. They don't stifle it. Instead, they do the opposite. They draw us out. They surprise us. They, they allow us to fully engage with the problem because there's more at stake. We're more invested. It also allows us to in a paradoxical way, become less worried about putting out a wrong answer. It reduces the cost of error because we can say all sorts of silly things because if it really is silly, then someone else will correct it. I had the pleasure of seeing this kind of dissent process in action when in research for the book I'm working on now on creativity, I got to spend a couple weeks at Pixar. And the thing that probably surprised me most about the Pixar process is how they begin every morning. So they've got this elaborate cereal bar, and so everyone gets their cereal, they get their organic coffee, they go into the small theater, and then they begin what they call the shredding process. And the shredding process is about as pleasant as it sounds. They sit there and watch the 50 to 100 frames they'd come up with the day before, and they proceed to tear them apart as a group. You know, it's 30 people, 30 lead animators, computer scientists, computer programmers, editors, directors, writers, music people, sound people, and they just tear it apart. They point out all the flaws, all the errors, all the drawings that don't work, the facial expressions that don't quite fit, the sound that's off. And it often feels, to an outsider at least, like a fairly brutal process. Here are people eating their Honey Nut Cheerios and Cap'n Crunch, and they're just tearing each other apart. But this Pixar has realized is a crucial part of its creative process. That is how they create such good and successful such good and successful films. As Ed Catmull, their president, puts it, he describes their process going from suck to non-suck. And as he says, the only way you get there is by noticing all the things that really suck. It's very simple when you put it like that. But that's what it takes. The only way you improve your iterations is by being honest and open about what doesn't work. That is how you really get people to be there, to fully engage with the problem, to encourage acts of dissent. Now, of course, it's important to not let these acts of dissent get out of control to spiral, to spiral away, which is why Pixar encourages what they call plussing, which is that for every mean thing you say, you should also add a plus. You should try to build on the idea, not just tear it down. But you know, in all honesty, sometimes even when people try to engage in plussing, they can still be a little harsh, still be a little overly critical. But According to Pixar, that's just the nature of the business. That's one of the trade-offs you make. You can either have really good ideas, you can either get to that non-suck platform in the end and really end up with a good movie, or you can all be polite and nice to each other. It's sometimes creativity requires a little harshness, requires us to really point out what doesn't work, even if it hurts someone else's feelings. Just in closing, I'd like to end with kind of a larger note on, I think, what this new science of creativity can teach us about the human mind, about human nature, and creativity in general. For a long, long time, we've treated creativity as a single thing, you know, as one mental process. Some people either have it or they don't. You're either blessed with a bountiful imagination, you're either Picasso or you're like the rest of us, and you're just kind of, you know, confined and consigned to not being a creative. But I think that's exactly wrong. It's not at all what creativity really is. When you look at creativity from the perspective of the brain, what you discover is that it's not a single thing at all, that it's actually a bundle of distinct mental processes, and that people who seem more creative, that they simply know how to get more out of their mind. They simply know how to make sure they're using the right kind of mental process at the right time, because sometimes we need to take 
long, warm showers. Sometimes we need those moments of insight. Sometimes when we're stuck, we need to get those alpha waves going. And sometimes when we've got those feelings of knowing, we need to drink that triple espresso. Sometimes we need to persist and persist and persist with the faith that the answer will eventually arrive, that the feeling of knowing will become actual knowledge. Sometimes we need to be polite, and sometimes we need to dissent. Sometimes we need to be a little harsh to end up with the creation we can all be proud of. Because I think if there's one thing we can all take away from this new science of creativity, it's that we can all imagine more if only we know how. Thank you very much for listening, and I believe we have a little time for questions and answers, uh, if there are any out there. But thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. The, the, the question for those who couldn't hear was, um, dissent may work, but how do you make the transition from a culture where uh, creativity, group creativity is all about brainstorming to one in which dissent is tolerated and allowed and perhaps even encouraged? That's obviously a very difficult task. I think places like Pixar had an advantage because that's been part of their mantra from the beginning. That's one of those things they imported from Steve's jobs, and that's also a big part of the Apple culture. Um, you know, this willingness to be open and to embrace mistakes, um, not failure avoidance, but just trying to fix your failures as fast as possible. So that's, 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 that's thing, been a core part of both cultures from the start. In terms of making the transition, I mean, I think I would begin with the empirical evidence. I would begin by pointing out all these studies, because the data couldn't be clear from the psychological side. All these studies that show brainstorming may feel nice, but it just doesn't work. That if we're really serious about putting people in a room, putting a large number of people, a lot of human capital in a room, and trying to get a good answer out of them, it's important to be honest about what's actually going to work. That brainstorming may make us feel nice, but it's not going to work. And here are all these studies which show why it doesn't work. And instead, we've got to practice constructive criticism and acts of helpful dissent. And I think that's how I would try to make the transition, is to be very blunt about what the data says. Um, and and you know, I think it's important not to sugarcoat the you know, hurt feelings and the pain of the process, that you know, brainstorming is going to feel better. But if you really are serious about getting good ideas from a group, then you may have to hurt people's feelings a little bit. You may have to criticize them. You may have to tear some ideas down. But in the end, everyone will be more proud of what they create together. I think I saw another question back there. Um, you know, it's, it's something. When you ask Pixar where they got the idea from, they'll talk about Apple and Steve Jobs, and they also talk about the Toyota manufacturing process, about the idea that anyone on the assembly line could pull the red cord, that failures were not the result of an individual, but the result of a collective breakdown. And for them, that was a very influential idea. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of companies out there which have fully embraced the dissent model. Um, in general, though, I would point to artists, uh, and, you know, especially when you go to Art Academy, a, good art school, the idea of not engaging in constant criticism is totally alien. It's a crazy idea. Because of course, the way you get better, it doesn't matter if you're a photographer, or you're a painter, or you're a musician, the way you get better is to be told over and over and over again what isn't working, what the flaws are in your work. So I would almost look to art schools as a great demonstration of how you need criticism to really improve yourself. That That, that is how you engage with your work, and that's how you get your work to be better. Um, so it, it gets back to this idea of not spending all our time trying to avoid failures, realizing that failures are inevitable, instead trying to just fail as fast as possible, trying to fix our failures together. And the way you get to that space, the way you create that kind of process where failures you just kind of iterate, 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 kind of the Pixar model, I guess, um, is to be open about what doesn't work. There really is no shortcut. There is no way around it. It's not going to be fun. It's not always going to be pleasant. Um, but, but that's what the data suggests actually works. Thank you so much for listening. It really is a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. <laughs>